day and have the opportunity to worship together in his house. We want to welcome you to the service, and as you're making your way in and finding your seat, we want to say a special word of welcome to those of you who may be here for the very first time. And if that's you, we invite you to take your device, uh, your phone, iPad, laptop, whatever it is you brought with you today, and go to westsidebaptist.org slash I'm new. And if you'll go there and begin filling out that information, we would love to get to know you uh, today in that way. And we want to say a special word of welcome to those watching online or on TV20. So glad you're joining us, and we invite you to come out in person anytime you're available. Uh, well, today's going to be a big day, so we've got a lot of things to cover. Uh, I appreciate that enthusiasm. One person is excited to be in his house today, and uh, we're grateful. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I shouldn't say that. You're all excited to be here, I know. Hey, today we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper, and on your way in, you should have received uh, one of these little uh, convenient, pandemic-friendly Lord's Supper packets. It's got the wafer and the juice right there. And so if you did not get one of these on your way in, just in a few moments, whenever it's convenient for you, slip over to one of the doors, and you'll find somebody there who can help you and will give you one of these little packets so that you can participate today. Now at Westside, we do practice open communion, so you do not need to be a member of our church to participate, only a baptized believer in Jesus Christ. And if that's you, we invite you to participate in the Lord's Supper with us today. After this service today, at, uh, right after this service is over, in room 206, that's upstairs in this building in the far hallway, there will be a mission trip interest meeting. If you are interested in going on a mission trip with us, travel is opening up again, and we are going to get back on schedule with our mission trips. And if you want to participate, that meeting is for you. It's right after this service in room 206. Also coming up in a couple of weeks, we have Memorial Day weekend, and we will have a special Memorial Day observance service on that Sunday night before Memorial Day. It will be right here in this room. And we'll have a solemn time of observing the holiday. And then also that evening, we're going to be welcoming our new worship pastor, Rob Flint, and his wife, Pam. And there's only one way that we could do that appropriately. It's with ice cream, with ice cream. And so we're going to have ice cream on that evening for Rob and Pam and uh, welcome them to Westside. Also, don't forget, VBS is coming up. It's coming so quickly, and it's uh, registration starting to fill up. So if you want your kid to be part of that, get on to westsidebaptist.org, and you can register there. Or if you want to be part of that and volunteer, you can do that on the website as well. Well, this morning we have a special privilege of witnessing believers' baptism. And why don't we celebrate that now that we get to witness believers' baptism this morning. So if you would, turn your attention up here to the tank for this special time. Good morning, everybody. It is so good to see you. And I'm up here with uh, my brother, Kyle Cruy. And uh, he is a part of our fellowship. And he has uh, been a Christian for a number of years, but never followed up his obedience with baptism. And so Kyle is here. If you're excited to see him baptized, say amen. Amen. All right, Kyle, well, let me hear your profession of faith. Have you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. And is it your desire to follow him all the days yes, sir. of your life? Yes, sir. Well, Kyle, based upon that profession of faith, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptized in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate that again. Come on. Let's stand to our feet this morning as we worship together.
fits Shouts like the sun in all of its brilliance The king of glory, the king above all kings Yeah, this is amazing grace This is a failing love That you would take my place you have our attention. God, we fix our eyes on you. God, I pray that right here, right now, we would truly seek your face. You have us, Lord. Lord, you have our attention. Every eye is fixed on you.
right now. Come on. We seek you. Sing it out. Right here. Right now. We trust you. In your presence falling down. In your worship falling down. Right here. Right now. Right here. church, you can be seated now. We want to just turn our attention to our time together around his word and then around the Lord's table and hopefully you got that little cup. And we're going to talk about having harmony as a family and you know the Lord's Supper really was something that was meant to unite in a sense it was to unite the church family but it also can unite the everyday family and it is I think every parent's desire to see all their kids come to know Christ and then together you can celebrate and come around the Lord's table there's nothing like Christ being the center of your home the very Lord of your home And so that's my prayer as we pray together, that he's not only just Lord in your heart, that he's also Lord in your home, as he is Lord and the head of our church. Let's just turn our minds and our hearts towards Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? Right here, right now, as we just sang, he wants to speak to you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to challenge you. He wants to see healthy families that are battling sin and battling the challenges, that are walking through the tough times with grace and forgiveness. He wants to help marriages just be a reflection of grace and forgiveness and love. For those of you who are watching through a television or an iPad or an iPhone or however you're watching on TV. God wants to do a remarkable work in your life, but it is when we come to the point of our desperation that that really happens, where we open up our hearts and we say, God, we we can't do family the way we want to do it without you. We can't do life the way we want to do it without you. So just for a moment, if you would, just ask him to speak to you today. Father, all that we are and all that we have, it comes from you. You are the all in all. You are our great Father and Redeemer. And we need so much to hear your word. We need so much to have it change our hearts. And we want that not just for selfish reasons, not just so we experience your peace and your knowledge and your love in a deeper way. We want it for our families. We want it for the relationships the people that are sitting right beside us, we want to be more like Jesus for them. So God, I pray as we've lifted up praises, as we listen to your word, as we, as we pray, as we take the Lord's Supper, all of this, God, we, we ask that you would do things in us that we can't possibly do ourselves. We're dependent upon you. God, we give our offering today. We give our tithes and our offerings just as an act of love, an act of obedience and an act of just total dependence upon you. And so we faithfully give today. 
Thank you. Receive our offering of praise. Receive our offering uh, of first fruits from all you provided us. Take our offerings of prayer, Father, and may it just bless you today, God, because we love you. We adore you. We worship you and you alone. And it's in Jesus' name we worship and we pray. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy storm, Messiah still. sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus
praise you, Lord. We lift you up in this place. There is no name that is higher. There is no name that is greater in the name of Jesus. Jesus, as we look to you this morning, as we go to the table and we, we look at the sacrifice that you made for us, as we eat and we drink, we do these things in remembrance of you and the sacrifice you made. As we cast our minds to Calvary, that we remember that you are Lord. Remember that you have conquered death. You have conquered sin. You have overcome the grave. You've overcome this world. And you, Jesus, is the power. It's in that name that we gather. It's in that name that we sing. And it's in that name that we go to your word now. We ask you, Jesus, to change us. Holy Spirit, fill us. Let us know you more. In Jesus' name. many of you can identify with the blur? Just uh, life happens that way. You get busy. You get distracted. You have all the challenges that come your way each and every week. And it is in the blur of life, uh, I think, that we often take care of the urgent. We get involved in things that distract us, uh, things that aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves, but they can become uh, idolatrous. They can take the place of some things that are most important in our lives. And so in this series, Everyday Family, today I wanted to talk about making sure that we kept our priorities in order. We've talked about love, we've talked about discipline, we've talked about a number of things, but uh, all of it kind of, there needs to be a, a, a hierarchy of priority in your life. And so take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, and as you uh, turn to Colossians chapter 3, let me just bring out a little blast from the past here. Uh, it's a jar, and six years ago, in 2015, I did a series. I just arrived. I've uh, been here maybe a year when I start, did a series on the family, and I brought out a jar full of these marbles. Now, you can purchase this jar. It's called a legacy jar. And in this jar uh, is a really kind of a depressing reminder of reality. There are about 930-some little marbles that come in a bag, and you pour them in here. And the, the idea is you have one of these jars for each of your children, and every week you take out a marble and put it in a bag, every week of their lives. And so I, I, was, I started giving these out to parents uh, when they would have children, but then I realized, uh, and, and I've had some of them tell me, that this is... is it's so stark of a reminder, sometimes it's hard to deal with, uh, that you start to see it disappear. But, but the idea behind this jar is priorities. 
that your time is limited, your influence, that window of opportunity to really have prime influence in your child's life diminishes week after week after week. And so in, 19, in 2015, my youngest two were in sixth grade, and I brought out a jar with the number of weeks that I had before they graduated high school. And it, was, it looked something like this, about 350 marbles. Now, you want to know how many marbles we have left? I can hold them in my pocket. Three. Three weeks. It's just to make sure we think about our priorities. Three weeks before my youngest two, who just, I mean, it seems like a year ago, I started as pastor in my mind here. They were in sixth grade. Now, three weeks before they graduate. Folks, we need to make sure we are maximizing the moments. And whether you have children now, you're going to have children, or you've had them in the past, all of us should have the same kind of passionate desire to see the next generation discipled for Christ. However we can do it. If our primary goal is giving and we're we're supporting those that do or we're uh, we're coming alongside and we're being life group leaders in the student ministry or we're being preschool leaders in the preschool ministry or we're we're friends, family friends with others who have children and we're helping influence their kids for Christ. We're part of a network. Or or maybe we're young. Maybe you are a teenager, uh, a child or a college student and you're looking towards... Uh, the future and the last thing on your mind at this point is having kids you say I am one pastor well listen your life is a preparation for discipleship it's a preparation for influencing others for Christ and so these priorities from the Apostle Paul are not just for the family It's, it's actually in the setting of priorities for a church but even in this setting where he's given the priorities for the church He rolls it over onto the family. And he says, families, you are a little church, part of the big church, and the same priorities need to matter. And so in Colossians chapter 3, we've got some some really some wonderful, but I'm going to warn you, some challenging words from the Apostle Paul. And why is he challenging them? Why is he using such strong language and really trying to encourage them with priorities? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they are facing a lot of what we're facing. This church at Colossae had some false teachers that were around town, some maybe even in the church, who were giving them some extra stuff they needed to do to really be Christian. He said, listen, if you're going to be a Christian, you need to uh, have these special revelations from heaven. Or you need to have these special legalistic requirements and go back and do some of the things the Jews did. They had different pockets of people who were trying to add to the gospel, add to Jesus, and they were complicating, turning this Christian life into a blur for them. And Paul's saying, no, listen, you need, to, you need to make sure you put that stuff aside, and I want you to focus on the priority. And as I read this text, I think you'll pick up the priority. Let's look at it, verse 1. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ... If you've been raised with Christ, what does that mean? That means if you have placed your faith in Him, you've been born again of the Spirit, you have been literally spiritually resurrected, even though physically that hasn't happened. If, In other words, you're a Christian. You're a born-again Christian. If you've been raised with Christ, then it ought to transfer into your daily, everyday family. And what's it going to look like? We're going to have these, some of these priorities. Look, you're going to see the things that are above. You're going to seek most the things that are above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. You are to set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on earth. For you have died. Your old self, you've died. And now your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In the first four verses, the name of Christ has been mentioned four times. Jesus is the very center. He is the chief priority of our lives. 
as believers. I bet if I had you raise your hand, most of you in here would say, I am, we are a Christian family. Well, that's easy to say in America. Most people uh, statistically would say we are Christian families. But what this passage challenges us to think about is the Christian family is a Christian is not just in name only. It is a family that is operating under a series of priorities, operating under the headship of Christ. And their minds are focused on Christ, on things above, and Christ is coming back, and we're looking forward to it. Now look at verse 5. He says, not only do we set our minds on heavenly things, look at verse 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly. You're to be an assassin of sin in your life. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Now I want to just dial you in while I read the rest of this. I want you to think of it with your family, with your brothers, with your sisters, with your husband, your wife, with your parents. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with its practices. You put on a new self. The new self's not a liar. The new self doesn't talk obscene from the mouth. The new self uh, isn't filled with anger, wrath, and malice and slander. Put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, the image of Christ. In fact, you are so much in Christ. Look at verse 11. You're so focused on Christ you're not even focused on the difference between a Greek and a Jew. That one of you is Greek and one of you is Jew. That doesn't really matter. You are so focused on Christ. You're not worried that you're a female or he's a male. That all these things, they matter on an earthly perspective, but you are in Christ. And in Christ, there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is what? All. He is all and in all put then on therefore put on the go as god's chosen ones holy and beloved compassionate hearts kindness humility meekness and patience bearing with one another in your family if one has a complaint against you in your family forgiving each other as the lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive and above all these in those relationships in your home as well as the church and in your community but put on love that binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and in your home to which indeed you were called in one body and be grateful be thankful let the word of Christ dwell in your richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in your home, whatever you do as a mom or a dad or a child, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wives, submit to your husbands. Why? Because Christ is the head of the home. And He sets this pattern in place and as you're pouring your heart into Christ, you can uh, uh, submit to your husband as fitting into the Lord. And husbands, because Christ is your head, and you're sinking your, your roots deep into his love and his grace and his forgiveness, you love your wives as you love yourself, and you are not harsh with them because you love them as your own body. You love them as Christ loved the church. Children, you obey your parents because they're perfect and never make any bad decisions. You obey your parents because they're all wise and all knowing. Why do you obey your parents? Because your roots are so sunk into grace and the lordship of Christ and because you want to please the Savior. You obey your parents in everything for this pleases who? The pastor? The Lord. And Christ is all. And in all, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, 
handle them gently and lovingly, they're easily discouraged. So let's pray together. Father, as we open this text up, help us see and examine ourselves. Holy Spirit, exalt Christ in our heart and in our home. That we may impact the coming generation as best as we possibly can. That we may be the best potential followers of you. Use us, God. Change us. It is your word, Holy Spirit. Use it in our hearts today. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. So that very first verse has the word if in my text. You might want to change that to since. If or since you are a Christian home, there are priorities. There are things that should mark you. There are non-negotiables. What are some of those things? Well, the first thing that we see can be categorized, I think, under one big heading. It is a heavenly... Y'all still hearing me? Yes, my voice comes and goes. By the way, I'm having such a great day, I'm on my third mic for the day. <laughs> my waiters, for whatever reason, the waiters in the baptistry were not working well. I've lost my socks to wetness. <laughs> So I've gone Don Johnson, as Asa said this morning. I've gone Miami Vice, won't you? But anyway, I probably told you more than you ought to know. <laughs> but when I came out at the first service, I was dark gray from here down. My socks, I didn't, they, it, but the battery felt good. Um, I didn't notice the water was seeping in. Isn't God good? You just keep on preaching. Just keep on going, amen? You just keep on going, whether you got socks or not. You got to pursue a heavenly mindset. Pursue a heavenly mindset. What does that mean? Well, you set your minds on things above. That's just hard because we live on earth. And I wake up to earthly issues. You wake up to earthly issues, earthly problems, earthly bodies. We have earthly desires, earthly passions. We want to collect earthly things. We're dealing with other earthlings. But what, what he's saying here is that for, for the, the kind of life to maximize those moments with your kids, to really be the greatest influence you can in your everyday family, to really, to really maximize your influence, your anchor can't be in earth and you think occasionally about heavenly things. That's kind of how a lot of people operate. I'm anchored to earth, but I hope for heaven. He says, no, your life is hidden with Christ. Your, your life is hidden with Christ. You have been raised from earth spiritually. You are spiritually in Christ. I love that it says my life is hidden with Christ. He's just got, he's got me hidden. He's got me covered. I am anchored in heaven living an earthly life. And so our minds have to transfer that way. And I, I really just know that as, as we can develop that, and, and it's a battle to do that, if we become more obsessed about heavenly reward rather than earthly reward, if we become more obsessed with our people, am I influencing people towards Christ who, uh, and, and their heavenly destiny, which lasts forever, am I doing more towards that direction than I am just this direction? It doesn't mean that I shouldn't participate in earthly things and do my job well and have, have cars and houses and, and dogs and some of those things, you know, that are earthly things. It is, it is those things are temporary. They don't last and they don't satisfy. But my mind is in an eternal, everlasting, totally satisfying place, Christ. So as a father, my job is to point my wife towards Christ, my children towards Christ. It's so easy to point them towards, and I think about it all the time, especially as my kids are getting older, they're graduating. What do you think about as parents? Good, please help them get a job. Amen. Please get them off my payroll. Get them uh, educated. Get them, you're, you're looking towards earthly things 
And those are earthly important things to help disciple your kids in earthly decisions, to make wise decisions. But you, but, but you have to keep that heavenly perspective. This is very temporary. And so we set our minds on things above where our life is hidden. You know what that is? Is It's really an identity. An identity. If I were to ask your family, who are you? What, how would your family answer? What would be their list? Who are you? Well, my kids would go, we're Chauncey's maybe. Maybe they'd say, oh, we're Chauncey's. We're Chauncey's. I got a family crest. I don't know, mom or dad had it painted years and years and years ago. And it's, it's a painting. Somebody painted it. How many of you have a family crest? You know what I'm talking about? You know, it's kind of a picture. It's got, a, got one of those uh, uh, old uh, armored helmets and flags from... England and Scotland and Ireland and where our heritage kind of goes back to some of those places and I think it's really really cool so I've kept it uh, and I don't really we don't hang it up but it, I have it because it's an identity it's kind of cool to know yeah I'm connected back there and and uh, uh, have that identity and then maybe you've got identities of, of particular sports teams or maybe you've got a political party sign in your in, on our bumper sticker or maybe you've got t-shirts or maybe you're wearing we've got all sorts of things that identify us but my prayer is that the first thing that would come to my mind in my family's mind is we are of Christ we are followers of Christ Number one, identity. I have been raised with Christ and my life is hidden in Him. I might be an American, I might be a Jamaican, I might be a Russian, I might be uh, Polish, I might be something else, but my, f my first priority, my identity is in Christ. You want their identity there, don't you? You want your identity there. The, the, the people that he's writing to in Colossae were being divided into identity factors. We're of the legalist party. We're of the um, uh, docetists. We are of the Gnostics. We believe that you need this special revelation to be a good Christian. We believe you need to do these particular things to be a good Christian. And it was dividing up the church. Homes become the same way. And so what we, what we want is for our, all of our family and our children to come together and say, our primary identity in life is Christ. Christ in all. And we've seen over the last few years, over the last few years, how well has it worked out in our nation with everybody fighting for their own personal identities? It's not going well. When we just focus on, well, I'm part of this group, I'm part of this party, I'm part of this group, and, and uh, our ethnicity and our, our uh, particular um, uh, football team or our particular state or our particular um, uh, 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 restaurant or our particular uh, style, we focus on all sorts of kind of th things that label us, and those labels are important they, but they don't define the Christian in a primary sense you are of Christ you're Christian and so he says pursue a heavenly mindset it starts with your identity and your focus the second thing that we see begins in verse 5 a focus on putting to death sin putting to death sin in your life he says you are to pursue a holy lifestyle he says you are chosen in one of those verses you are chosen you are set apart and your lifestyle is to reflect that look at this holy lifestyle beginning in verse 5 put to death therefore what is earthly in you sexual immorality impurity passion evil desire covetousness which is idolatry. You know, if you begin to look at all these verses, you can put them under three basic categories. There, is, there are passions that have been perverted or, uh, or, or inordinate that have overtaken your life, some types of passions. There are hot tempers 
things that you do when your temper's out of control, and then there's sharp tongues, thing that you do with this terrible instrument we have, the tongue, where we can uh, be deadly with that. He says you are to name the sin in your life, and you are to put it to death. You are going to be a continual assassin of sin because you want a holy standard in your life and a holy standard in your home. He says in verse 8, put them all away. Put all, put what, what away? Anger. Put it all away. Wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. There's, there's so much here. And your home and my home are, are all complicated amalgamations of personalities and opinions and past influences. And so you've got unique th things going on in your marriage, with your kids, with your parents. All of that kind of mixes in. And you're going to have to apply this. Uh, uh, you're going to have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you apply it to your particular life. But to apply it, you need to go in with the right standard. And he says, here's the standard. The standard is, if, if I'm inordinately angry, I've got I've to put that away. Because anger is going to destroy those relationships in my family. If I'm wrathful, if the people in my family fear when I get angry because I lose control, I've got to put that away. I've got to somehow put that to death. If, if my mouth is characterized by obscene talk, that is sin that must be dealt with. Because Christ expects his homes, Christian homes, to have a holy standard. Now he knows there's going to be moments. But he knows he has given you his spirit and his word. I love how Paul just, he names it and he kills it. He names it. And he says, here's what I think you need to do as parents. You need to establish standards in your home that have a biblical uh, foundation. Here's a good list right here. You can't strike out in anger in that way. You've got to be able to handle that anger appropriately because it can become sin sinful. It's not sinful to get angry. It's sinful to not handle it and deal with it in the right way. And so you establish those standards in your home. We talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago under discipline. Do you remember that list uh, of the holy lifestyle I gave you of, of discipline? You, you have to discipline a holy standard into your home. You first of all need biblical convictions. What do I believe is wrong and right? And it's okay to walk through that with your family and with your kids. This is wrong. This is right. Sexual immorality is wrong. It's wrong not just to participate in it, but you need to be very careful to guard your eyes and guard your heart, what you're watching, what you're listening to. You need to set up some biblical convictions uh, uh, in, in, in that area. And with wrath and, and anger and slander, it's very easy for slander to happen in a family. You know, when you are in a family, you know that person in your family more than anybody else does. Right? Do you ever feel scared that your kids are going to tell people what you're like? You ever, you ever scared your brother or sister? You know they look at you like, don't make me tell them what you're really like. You have weapons at your disposal as a family member where you could slander and harm the reputation of your brother or sister or your mom or dad. We, can, we, we have weaknesses and you have to be careful to handle the weaknesses of your siblings and your parents and your loved ones with great gentleness and care. That's what love is. Love covers wrong. It doesn't expose it and uses it against one another. Remember we were talking about love last week? 
love doesn't uh, count up sins. I forget how it puts it. But some of you have a jar with every one of your sibling's sins in it. You collect them. Oh, I got another one. Or your spouse, I got a whole jar full of your failings. And the next time you fail, I bring out the jar. I bring out the jar. So we need to have biblical convictions, but we need not to uh, slander one another. And so some of the rules that we've established in our homes involve how we speak about and to one another uh, uh, in anger and wrath. And there are words that you shouldn't use, but you need to say, why shouldn't we use those words? And do not lie to one another, verse 9. That ought to be a biblical conviction in your family. We, we tell the truth. We tell the truth because we put off the old and put on the new. So we have biblical convictions. I mentioned that we keep those relational connections, second of all. We want to build strong relationships and keep those open so that we can help one another through those things. Challenge one another without it breaking down the relationship. The third thing that we do is through those relational connections is we have instructed conversations where we talk to each other about the truth. I encourage you as a family, read the Bible together and have some family devotions. And what you do is you talk about life and you apply these, these biblical principles to life and you talk about it and you struggle through these things together. You faithfully attend church together as a family. You talk about what you learn at church. How do we have instructive conversations? Well, I don't, don't go home and get a pulpit and sit your kids down and preach to your children like I preach to you on Sunday mornings. That won't get you very far. It is these instructive conversations day in and day out. Go serve the poor, serve the sick, serve some less fortunate people together as a family. Go on a mission trip together as a family. Let them see you witness. Let them see you serve people. Pray for your neighbors together. Discuss sermons or Bible lessons. Television shows. Discuss some things together. When you uh, uh, go in and watch the video games they're playing for a while and discuss them from a biblical perspective. It's interesting. Have some instructive conversations. But then you also, if you're going to have a holy standard, you've got to have some predictable consequences for sin. For sin. Predictable consequences. Notice what he says, Paul says uh, to Timothy. He says, preach the word, 2 Timothy 4, be ready in season and out of season. He says, you've got to set the standard. That's what preaching the word does. Here's the standard. And you set that, and then you've got to reprove and rebuke. There's discipline. Reprove is at about this level of getting to, of explaining why it's wrong. Rebuke is like basically saying, all right, I've explained why. Here's what's going to happen if you don't stop. And so you have levels of discipline and, that are predictable in your home for breaking those biblical standards. That's the only way that you help these young people as they're growing, especially as little kids. Help them see this is right, this is wrong. And you know, you know, family, you know that these children, what they're going to need to have ultimate victory, they need Jesus. They need to come to Christ and have the Holy Spirit in their life. But what you're doing is helping them identify things. And if we just let sin roam free in our home and in our lives, they're going to begin to think that's appropriate. So we've got to be very careful. You know, I'm the official bug killer in our house. I mean, there are some. I've seen some others in our house kill bugs, but evidently I'm the real bug killer because bugs are not welcome, you know? Ants, roaches, those kind of things. And I, I know my wife kills me because I bring things up this, and you all think we have a rodent, ant-infested, roach-infested house, which we don't. Our house is very clean. I'm just using this... How many of you, how many of you moms in particular, if a roach runs across your kitchen, you're going to go, I hope they got enough to eat. I hope they're comfortable. I hope they feel as warm and welcome in our home 
I have the gift of hospitality. <laughs> or if a mouse or a rat ran through your kitchen, how would you react? And yet there are things in our homes coming across the airwaves, things that we're putting in our mind, things that we're letting our kids do that are much more foul than roaches and rodents. We have no reaction. You ever get convicted of that? We will jump up on the couch and scream. That. And yet make a pet of something truly sinful. So we have, to, we have to help our young people see that is not right. And here's why it's not right. It's not right because I, did, I say it's not right. It's not right because it breaks God's ultimate design, what his holy standard is. And so we, we put consequences on that, and we become a bug killer. We point it out and say, hey, do you all like roaches? No, we don't. All right, let's deal with that. We spray. We have, call in the, the guy, he comes and he sprays the house. And then occasionally, if one escapes the perimeter, it's war. War on that little insect, it's going to die. We had a bird in our house the other day. You ever had a bird flying in your house? Cutest little bird, we caught it with a net. And we got the little bird, I had the little bird in my hand and Grab the bird, I guess I'm the bird catcher too, and I'll take it and let it out. But here's what's funny is uh, over the last couple of weeks, we will find bird droppings. So the bird was around, and when the bird, we didn't know the bird was in there for a little while, it left marks. It left little traces of being in our home. Disgusting, right? What's the standard for your spirit? For the holiness of your heart. Just a challenge. Paul says, name it and kill it. Put it away. Those things that, you see, you're, you, Christ is the head of your home. Christ is the head of your home. And don't forget the last thing. He says, uh, other than predictable consequences, and this is where I forget sometimes, is have affirming celebrations. We reprove, we rebuke, but we also exhort and encourage when we see positive, uh, when we see people handle challenges well and we see treat each other well, we got to have positive affirmations in the right way because there's enough of, of, of negative things coming upon us and, and we fail uh, uh, and, and we feel conviction and our kids feel convicted and we need to come along and say there's hope in Christ and when there are good things that occur and we see um, us overcome sin, we celebrate that and we give God the glory. We give Him the glory through affirming celebrations. So we need a heavenly mindset. We've got to pursue, and it's a continual battle. A continual battle, a holy life. There are branches of Christianity that believe you can kind of get into an area of complete freedom, and, and there may be moments where you don't struggle with sin and brokenness. But I tend to, I tend to be more on the side of of Romans chapter 7. This description, if you would turn with me there, then we'll move to the Lord's Supper. But in Romans chapter 7, Paul is describing what I think is, is not his pre-Christ life. I think it is still an honest reflect, reflection of the battle within his own heart. He says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God. I want a holy standard in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Let me just pause right there. 
sometimes in my life, and I know sometimes in your life, and I want you to know in your young person's life, they're going to be thinking that verse because they've been taught this is right, this is wrong, and they're going to have feelings and inordinate passions, and they're going to sin, and they're going to fall into different things and they will struggle and they'll know that's not right and you may discipline and discipline them but in their heart of hearts they're wondering wretched man who is going to save me from this body of death and what they need at that point is a is a parent who has those firm boundaries and who says no this is God's holy standard and who has predictable consequences but also what they need most is a parent who comes in and says I'll tell you who delivered me from this body of death who's continuing to deliver me and that is Jesus Christ our Lord we're a Christian family where Christ is the center of the home and he has come to offer grace and forgiveness and peace and to help us on this journey because the last thing we want to do is, is have uh, our complicated young people who are challenged with all that you and I are challenged with thinking that they are unsavable, that grace can't, can't overcome their sin, and that Christ is not doing a work in their lives. Join them on the journey. Set the standards. Deploy the discipline. But always bring that good news, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, He will deliver us. You know when you start losing is when you stop struggling and stop fighting the spiritual warfare in the home. And then priority three, I'm going to break this down in one more sermon on the family next week. Priority three, we need to strive and pursue to have harmony in the home. Harmony. Look at what it says in verse uh, 12. Doesn't this sound wonderful? Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, in your home, compassionate hearts. Be compassionate with one another. Be kind. Be humble, be meek in your home. Be patient. Bear with one another. And if one has a complaint against each other, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, as you also must forgive. Forgive each other because you have been forgiven. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect, what? Harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. When Christ is the head of the home, you are pointing to one who brought incredible grace. And if he's the, he's the center of the home, you will be continually pointing to the cross. You'll keep pointing to the cross because at the cross, you see the most incredible family love you'll ever see. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but can have everlasting life. He gave Christ, and at the cross you see this blend of, of God's wrath and God's grace and God's love for you. And so to help bring harmony in the home, we point our hearts continually to the work of Christ on the cross. And that's what we want to do right now as we take communion together. I want you to join me with your heads bowed. And just take a moment of reflection. As the music plays quietly, I just want you to think about what Christ has done for you. Parents, in your own heart of hearts, just take your children to the cross with you in prayer and Maybe if you're struggling in your marriage, take your marriage there. 
Take your husband there, your wife there, and at the cross you find not only an example of extreme forgiveness, of amazing grace, you see um, what can actually bring healing, what can give you the ability to work each and every day towards the kind of marriage and home and family that you want and that God wants for you. Just spend some time now confessing your sin, confessing your need to the Lord before we take this Lord's Supper together. going to read in just a moment from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and it's Paul's um, example of the Lord's Supper on that evening with the Lord and his disciples, and he, he gives this wonderful statement, and I use this all the time, but I don't always tell you the context. He's writing about how to have the Lord's Supper because that church family had a lot of divisions in it in fact some of the sin and some of the anger and malice and hatred was happening at the Lord's Supper and he's bringing them back together and he's saying Christ ought to be the very center of what you're doing and he says taking this Lord's Supper if you do so without making your heart right with one another it actually brings a type of judgment into your life and so make your family right Work on being in right relationship with your family, he says in this passage. Your church family and your family at home. Examine yourself, he says, before coming to the Lord's table. So maybe as you take the bread and the juice in just a moment, it's a time of you committing to say, Lord, I want to make things right. I don't want there to be jealousy or envy or anger or resentment in my home Father thank you so much for uh, the teaching of your word that challenges us the standard you put but for the grace that uh, enables us to to grow in it and to live we thank you for these elements that represent the gift of your son Jesus we take them now in honor and in memory of him in Jesus name Amen If you'll take that first little film, layer of film there, there's two. If you take the first one and peel it back, it will expose the little wafer. And Paul said this, For I received from the Lord what I'd also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Father, that you did not... Hold all that we have done in rebellion against you. You've not held it all against us. You took it all and you put it on Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving your body and your blood and your life for us. In the same way, uh, he also took the cup after supper and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. So if you'll pull that little film back will reveal the juice. He passed it to his disciples and 
He was uniting them together in Christ as a family, as he's uniting us today. He said, do this. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I wanted to do something a little bit as we close our service today. Um, we're going to be talking more about harmony next week. But let's stand together. I wanted us to create a little harmony. I think we can do it. Would you stand with me? And just pick a part. And if you can't sing, we want to hear whatever comes out of your mouth. You just sing harmony. Because we're, this, is the, this is the song, is the reality of what brings harmony in the home. His grace. His grace. So harmonize with me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. When we've been there, sing the last verse together and harmonize. When we've been there, ten thousand. Bright shining as the sun. We've no less days. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Father, I just pray that there will be harmony in our homes and in our lives because of your grace. May we be so root, deeply rooted in our identity with you, our heavenly home that we're anchored in, that we can be free from the earthly jealousies and things that would, would, would cause us to be divided and we would love one another, encourage one another, set a holy standard for our life. God, and glorify you in everything that we do and say. Help us do it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before you head out, thank you so much for being here. Let me just encourage you. There's a lot going on coming up in May and in June. Make sure you're a part of those things. And on your way out, if you're a guest, I'd love to meet you. I'm going to be right up here. And if you don't have a walk with the Lord or if you need some, some, just some encouragement, I'd love to pray with you and encourage you and however the Lord would, would lead. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.